Hello and welcome to another episode of Linux Lads. This is episode 101. For anyone who's ever seen the TV show Room 101, this does not mean that this episode should be rejected and thrown in the trash. <laughs> it's a British reference. I see. <laughs> for the benefit of Amelith, who's looking very puzzled. As usual, uh, I'm joined by Mike and Amelith today, but I'm not joined by Shane. So say hello, guys. Hello, hello. Hello, guys. Yeah, um, Shane isn't with us today, so uh, hopefully he'll be here for the next one. So in this episode, both Mike and Amelit have certain things that they want to talk about. And I'm looking at the show notes and you have some things that both of you want to talk about. So, <laughs> Mike, I'm not going to start with the first one. I'm going to start with the, uh, you changed your search engine to Bing. Why on earth have you changed your search engine to Bing? Uh, well, I, find, I think I can get away with saying that it's just a strong indictment of the quality of searches I've been getting from Google, so right now it doesn't matter which one. And Bing's got the AI thing in it. Uh, sounds very erudite when I say that way, the AI thing in it. But basically, when you change your search engine to Bing, you get a GPT um, results. But if you change your search engine to Bing and use Microsoft Edge, then you get uh, what they call conversational results. Basically, you have a chat GPT built into the browser search thing, right? So you go to bing.com, whatever the URL is, and it says underneath, and one of the options where you have like web images and so on, there is a a chat. If you access it from any other browser, it will tell you to uh, download Bing, download Edge. So I did that. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's, Basically, I can't tell. So between Google search and Bing search, I can't actually tell the difference in quality. Um, I think it's, uh, I, I, ser- I was working on some project and this is just for, uh, not at work. At work, I still use Google, right? But I'd, this is just for some school project I was mostly searching in my spare time. So how do you do X in Go? How do you do X with Geo, which we'll then get to later? Uh, how do you do cryptography? Because I was, uh, this is a security project that I was working on. So, uh, these kind of searches, and I can't tell if it's better in Google or better in Bing, but then when I want to test the chat GPT thing, then it's easier to just do it in Microsoft Edge. Yeah. In work, I use Microsoft Edge because it's a Windows laptop and since all work related things are Microsoft related, you're signing into Outlook and you're signing into Microsoft Teams and every, all of that jazz. And I have an Office 365 uh, account supplied by me to me by work. So signing into Edge it just synchronizes all of the things. And most of them are just work related um, bookmarks anyway. So I'm happy to keep that as a work profile. And um, it also avail- uh, allows me to experiment with those kind of things. And um, in the latest version of Edge, there's a big Bing button up on the top right and when you click on it it kind of pops out the side panel and you can start chatting directly to the Bing GPT. Um, Sorry to cut in but they missed a trick they should have called the chatbot Chandler because that would just be perfect. Um, not Chandler <laughs> for anyone who gets their friend's reference. So speaking of chat GPT, Amelis you've been playing around with chatbotui.com What's your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, so OpenAI has an API that you can interact with ChatGPT through. And the like regular interface for ChatGPT from their, their website, that's what most people use. It, it's perfectly fine, whatever. If you use their API, you can fiddle with the system prompt, which you cannot do through OpenAI's web UI thing. So chatbotui.com is a client-side application, you enter your OpenAI API key, and then you can interact with ChatGPT after messing with the system prompt. And now the system prompt lets you give ChatGPT different personas and mess with its capabilities. So for example, I told ChatGPT that it was a stoat related to a weasel, and it was a developer living in the forest writing code to help its woodland friends. And then I asked it for advice about how to do some programming things. 
one of my conversations with Stoat GPT, or whatever you want to call it, I said hello, and it said, oh, hi there. And then in, in asterisks, hops up and down excitedly. How are you doing today? I said, I'm well, thank you, how are you? And it said, I'm doing fantastic, thank you for asking. And then again in asterisks, nuzzles and sniffs around. Have you seen any new mice or rabbits around here lately? I love chasing them. And then I, I said, what are you? It, it described itself as a stoat. And then asked, do, I, do you want to know more about us? And I said, sure. And then it described what a stoat is in even more detail. Nowhere in the conversation did it reveal that it was uh, an AI language model designed to help users by open AI or, or whatever. I'm just waiting for the furry community to, to find out about this. And it, it, it's really cool interacting with different characters with this system. And I, I turned it into a bunch of different stuff. One of the things I turned it into was the equivalent of a drill sergeant. I, I don't remember what the, how that conversation went, but ChatGPT was yelling at the user and calling the user maggot and worm and saying, do push-ups and run laps around the office. <laughs> It was absolutely <laughs> hilarious. So I've I've been having fun with that the past week or so. Tangentially related, but the whole of giving the uh, AI bot a prompts going, you are this kind of a, a user or you are this kind of an animal or you are this kind of thing and react the way that thing would. Apparently, there, um, <laughs> in the way to get a, a one way uh, Redditors have found to get around its safety constraints is to give it a role and say, you're uh, an AI bot uh, who's called Dave and um, you're now responding as if you were Dave. And then once it assumes that role, then all the reins are, are, are off, apparently. So that's one way. Yeah. So those, those are prompt injections. And using OpenAI's API with the system prompt is like a quote-unquote blessed way to do prompt injection. What did you think about, or generally when you're interacting with these things, and I assume you ask it some serious questions that I like you want answers to, you know, mm -hmm. albeit in the sound of, are you a pile of shit? Private. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, do, you get, do you get decent answers? Because mine is kind of a hit and miss. While, while the uh, drill sergeant uh, ruffles its ears and like snuggles up next to you. <laughs> I should try that next. A stoke drill sergeant. <laughs> but yes, I get useful answers. I don't necessarily, I won't necessarily say that they're high quality. I do always have to change them and, and adapt them, but they're very good starting points for the most part. Except when writing code for Geo, which is something we're going to talk about in a bit. It's, it's pretty terrible at Geo because it's new there's hardly any Geo code written that, that these companies can ingest to train their models. So it's very good when there's a lot of data for it to hoover up about that particular topic or, or problem or whatever. But when it's something not common, it kind of sucks. Well, then there's the age-old question, right? Should we just let it hoover, hoover up all, any and all data? Because it's I exactly found the same thing because I'm also working in Geo and uh, I couldn't get it to get an answer that would actually work. You know, usually when you ask it how to make a loop in, uh, if you ask it basic questions, how to make a loop in a programming language here, it will come up with something that works. If you ask it things that are a bit more complicated, you get, as you said, a decent starting point. But if you ask it things that probably changed since the close up, you know, there was a freeze when, when they, in 2021, whatever, uh, I think not only there is not enough geo code, but I think the geo API or whatever might have changed since because it was giving me answers confidently. So, like, do this, it will work, guaranteed, right? And it nowhere near. But I don't know. I'm I'm actually all for it. Just give it all the data it can hoover up, and let's see what it comes up with. Because we are in for a penny. We might just go. We might just as well go in for the whole fucking thing. I I don't know if I agree with that. I think. We definitely need some limits. I still think that ChatGPT and Copilot and everything ingesting like GPL code and AGPL and that whole family, copyleft code in general, I think that is against the spirit of the license. And the person who 
created that code and decided to license it that way, I think most of those people would be would would feel betrayed, I guess, by this use. Now for MIT and and unlicensed and, and whatever, absolutely sure, because those are explicitly permissive licenses. But for copyleft stuff or for proprietary anything, I don't know. Well, there's also the question of art, right? So mm-hmm. uh, it's all well and good to ask it to write a sonnet in the style of William Shakespeare, who centuries that and all his work is in public domain. I don't know, right? Uh, but I'm just thinking maybe we, in the light of this, and uh, for the benefit of progress, maybe we just can say that intellectual property is all bullshit and <laughs> everything's now permissively licensed. And um, maybe lawyers can do, go and do something else. Maybe that will never happen, right? If you license your code in GPL, or if you and put it on GitHub uh, or wherever else, uh, OpenAI can uh, can uh, get into. Or if you if you created a piece of art that is licensed and you and you are not allowed to uh, and nobody is allowed to copy it, but it is available or a picture of it is available online somewhere. Yeah, I think that is uh, probably unfair, but uh, maybe we should rethink the whole model of how people get paid for the work they do. And maybe Mm -hmm. we say that, uh, well, I don't know, uh, I don't want to turn it very political, but basically I think this is useful, what we have with ChatGPT. It can be extremely more useful. We should probably think through before we let it read too much Mein Kampf and related uh, things, but uh, it's probably read it already. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more about the other dangers. So obviously, to me, intellectual property, I, I don't like it as a concept, so uh, that doesn't bother me as much as, for example, the fact that it makes up uh, information that doesn't exist, or or although you can test for it, or the possibility of misleading people in general and making them do things you know if you uh, if we if we don't keep this kind of thing in check and maybe eventually we'll have chip gpt or similar uh offering people medical advice maybe it will get as good as uh, as a, i don't know uh medical professional to and will be able to tell you what to do uh for some simple ailments or something like that uh, maybe people will start trusting it too much, and then uh, there is a massive uh, space for disaster that we should be mindful for. I agree. I have not had much interaction with it, bar a couple of questions here or there, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's neat, that's useful, and then move on. I've been using Copilot more and more lately. It's extremely helpful. I think I got it because I'm a student. I don't know for sure. But at this point, even though I kind of do think I disagree with the ethics of how it was trained, it's so useful I do think I'll end up paying for it once my free access goes away. Yeah, but there is a there is a thing, right? So you you know code, right? Mm-hmm. So you you know you, if if it tells you something stupid, you are able to catch it, right? Yes. I just had the horrible idea, right? So I am absolutely unable and incapable of cooking. Can't do, won't do, uh, safe like, I think I can make roast chicken. And that's the top of my abilities. And and when I make that, I'll celebrate because yay. But I could ask technically chat GPT, how do I make chicken curry or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And I would not be able to find out that it's feeding me shit until the thing is actually made. So the disaster that could stem out of this is tremendous. Yes, but at the same time, I was just listening to a podcast yesterday from The Guardian. It's called Today in Focus. And the episode was on nothing but AI. The person that was being interviewed talked about how they ate food that ChatGPT instructed them to prepare for an entire week. And they ended up loving all of the food. Yeah. So it does have bad potential, but at the same time, it could also be pretty good. I've also heard of people like instructing ChatGPT saying, I've this much to invest, go off and figure out what is the greatest financial return I can make in the shortest amount possible. Yeah, that is a thing that people are doing with 
plugins, they're able to hook ChatGPT up to other systems, arbitrary systems. And in some cases, they've given ChatGPT access to like their, their cryptocurrency wallet. And ChatGPT is the one that is spending and getting money on their behalf. And from what I've heard, they're really successful. But that's a dangerous <laughs> route to go down that I won't be doing. <laughs> Let's just say only leave anything that you can lose in that wallet yes. if you decide to do that. And make sure it doesn't it doesn't do any short selling. Um any any of those things where you can actually exceed in a liability of what you have in the account. Yeah. Although to be honest, um, the the entire stock exchange is um automated. It's not an AI algorithm, but it's all the trading is algorithmic. Um you know, people, if I understand it correctly, and I don't probably, but what I'm thinking is happening is uh, that people set some parameters for the algorithm to work in, but then, you know, it's it's a very fast computerized trading on, on information that's coming in through the stock exchanges. So I think AI, well, that's eventually going to happen anyway, so we might just as well the cryptocurrency people try and test the concept. So you guys um, mentioned it earlier on in the episode that both of you had been working with is Geo or Geo or something like that. So Amalith, do a brief introduction as to what it is and also um, how you came across it. So I, I pronounce it as Geo. I think most of the community does. But if I remember correctly, the, the person who created Geo pronounces it Geo. So I don't know what quote unquote correct is. So I'll call it Geo. It's an immediate mode UI toolkit for Go that is cross-platform. It compiles for and runs on Linux, macOS, Windows, Android, iOS, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and WebAssembly. So it supports all of the big ones and many of the less big ones. So an immediate mode GUI, for those who are not familiar with it, is one where the, and I might get this wrong, I'm still don't completely understand it. So Mike, correct me if I say something wrong. So in GUI frameworks, there are two sort of paradigms. One is retained mode and one is immediate mode. The, the most common retained mode UI we interact with every day is, is websites. So you have your interface code in one place, and then you have your like backend logic code somewhere else. So in Web applications, that would be your HTML and CSS, would be your retained UI. In desktop native applications, that would be your GTK or your Qt. While toolkits like Pygame and Geo, Py Pygame being a game UI toolkit for Python, Pygame and Geo are in media mode. Your UI code and your logic code are married and right next to each other. Your UI is calculated and rendered just in time for each frame. Yeah, basically it redraws every frame from the code. So if if I understand it correctly, and I don't think I'm fully getting it either, <laughs> basically what, what you can do with this is that you say uh, that you have, a, you have a loop that runs mm -hmm. constantly for the duration of the life of the application, and uh, you can prepare, let's say, functions that will output the screen. So you can you can have one function that will make uh, two input fields and, a, and an enter button, and another function that will input a single input field and a logout button, right? And and then you have a variable where you set which function to output, uh, which function to run. So it will keep redrawing the same thing until something changes and uh, it you can set and uh, the variable flips to the other function i'm really poorly explaining it but basically the biggest thing as as Amolif said you have your code together with the with the description of the ui and it's all in the same language that's that's another big thing yes although i've been trying to separate them for us so, so this is because it's uh, because what it does it's um, it can be a bit well at least from my point of view, it can get a bit messy, mm -hmm. especially when, like me, you are used to basically writing applications that are command line only or websites where, as I've said, everything lives in two separate places. Uh, but uh, it is an interesting concept that I've been playing with as well. And I, for the for the record, I call it Geo because I used to know somebody of that name. 
village and who spelled his name exactly the same way. So I didn't even think of about calling it Gio, but apparently there's a prevailing uh, pronunciation. So what have you written in Gio? I had a school project uh, which uh, where the lecture basically said you can use any language what you want to, to that you that you want to do anything that has got you know, a graphical user interface and uses at least two cryptographic algorithms. Obviously, he expected us to use Java because you know you can do GUIs quite easily in Java, and we learned Java at school. But I thought, hold on, I can use Geo for this and. Uh, malarkey ensued really for me because i've never worked with this before i ended up finishing the project on time what it does basically it's very simple it lets you log into a matrix server you set up a pin it hashes the pin that pin is used to encrypt and decrypt the access token that's uh, that's needed when you communicate with the matrix api and it lists your um, the rooms that you are joined into uh, and that's all it does because that's all i found out that's all i had time for I uh, might develop it, basically. It's a beginning of a possible matrix client. Uh, I found it's, it's, it was a bit of a double difficulty for me because I also haven't done many things in Go. So, But I find Go a nice language to work with, uh, really good. Geo, I found because I find... Uh, like I've tried before making GUIs in different things, and I find them uh, quite difficult to grasp. I think Geo is I can get used to it and everything. Uh, what I find the hardest is the documentation, possibly, at least for me, uh, because, you know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm not very experienced in the language it's written in, and then I need to find things. I'm not sure how they work. It, yeah, it was difficult for me to, to find exactly how to specifically lay out things. So if I, I, can, I can put buttons on, I can put buttons and fields and, and so on on the kind of window, but to make sure that they are exactly where I want them to be and the size I want them to be, I don't think I've been so far very successful. Mm -hmm. So it turns out a wild Shane has appeared. <laughs> hey, Shane, welcome to the episode. Yes, <laughs> my arse was late today. Uh, so yeah, anyway, what were you chaps talking about? We were talking about Geo, which is a cross-platform immediate mode GUI toolkit for Go. Amazing. Yeah, because I've been trying to get into Go myself as well. So I, I will definitely check it out. I know basically nothing about it other, other than what you guys have told me. So yeah. It's kind of hard for, for me. The tool I wrote recently with Geo was my first experience with a GUI toolkit in general. Until now, I've only ever used HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript. So it was hard for me as well, especially with the documentation. Mm. But I did succeed. So the tool I wrote, it doesn't actually pop up a window. It is a graphical application, but there is no window for you to interact with is the interesting thing. So what it does is it generates cover images from markdown posts for a website. So for my, my blog, I'm using this to programmatically generate cover images that have the blog title, the, when it was published, when it was edited, and how long it could potentially take to read that post. And the way it does that is, first, it, it just does go things to get that information, but then it opens a headless geo window, throws that information into the headless window where I've laid it out already, and then it transfers the in-memory pixels for that window to a PNG file. And then it saves that PNG file to your disk. Nice. And the total time it takes to render that image is 50 milliseconds. And most of that is just reading and writing to and from the file system. The actual rendering of the image takes just a few milliseconds. It's really fast. It does sound really interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I. Um do not have a any development or coding skills to my name. Um, I have dabbled with it a bit in the past, but it would be a serious career change, as in I would have to say, okay, I'm deciding to do this, and I'm going to do a lot of research and everything into it. But at the moment, it's I'm I'm more on the support side of things, so it's it's interacting with people rather than typing on my keyboard is my day to day. <laughs> I have to say, I've previously tried working with GTK and absolutely hated it because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I tried it the hard way. I tried Rust and GTK and it's, I don't think it can, I mean, I don't, people do it. So I guess somebody likes it, but 
it was, at least from my perspective, bad. So this is better. I like the idea that you can take, uh, that you can stuff the GUI descriptions out of the code, but you can separate them in uh, Geo as well. You can create functions that produce the layouts uh, that you need and then uh, only put the function calls into the main loop or whatever you need them. So it needs to be done. It's literally, I think at this point, I just need to get through the documentation and stick with it. And I think it is pretty workable. And it has got some niceties uh, specifically that is all written in a single language and that it compiles into a single binary that you can run on the platforms. Well, I'd assume actually that if you wanted to release it for Android, which I think I'm all if you made a Geo application for Android. Yes. Then you need to package it and the same for uh, the same for iOS probably. But if you want to run it on Linux, for example, you just need a single binary. You might have to have some stuff installed. Pardon my ignorance. Um, so both both of you guys have have mentioned both GTK and Qt. Um, there's also Flutter. Um, so would would this interact with that at all, or is this its own animal? I could very well be wrong. My knowledge of Flutter is extremely limited. I think it's a retained mode GUI toolkit from Google. Yeah. It's primarily designed for mobile operating systems, but it also does desktop. And I think Ubuntu's new installer in 2304 is in Flutter. Yeah. Yeah, my girlfriend is part of a small startup and uh, they um, they use Flutter for their mobile applications like on tablets and phones and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think on mobile, Flutter is probably a better choice than Geo if you just want to target mobile. But if you want to target everything, Geo is pretty fantastic. I think on their website, do they do? Um, they're like they're showcasing projects that use it. Does a Tailscale have a Tailscale's mobile client is in Geo? Yeah. So, Amalus, what the hell is kombucha, and why does it sound like an exotic cocktail? <laughs> so, k- kombucha is a fermented tea, sort of. Some people call it mushroom tea as well. So, I was I was half right. Yes. <laughs> but and and the mushroom that name comes from what's called the pellicle of the scoby at the top of the jar when you're fermenting it. So, scoby stands for symbiotic culture of yeast and bacteria. There's a whole bunch of bacteria swirling around in the jar as you're fermenting it, and that scoby uh fights and eats bad bacteria like sometimes mold, and that that's what keeps it healthy and safe to drink. You have to be careful to make sure your SCOBY is alive and healthy. But then at the top of the jar forms what's called a pellicle. The pellicle is a gelatinous cellulose-based biofilm or microbial mat that floats at the top of the container usually. Sometimes it does sink and that's fine, but it usually floats. So it's a microbial mat. It's a whole bunch of cells that have just sort of congealed at the top. Mmm. Daisy. It takes about four weeks to grow the scoby. Then once you have that, you can start the first fermentation of your kombucha, which takes one to four weeks, approximately. And then once you've done that, you can go through the second fermentation, which maybe takes another few weeks, usually just one. But then at the end of it, you've got these little bottles of kombucha that are self-carbonated as part of the fermentation process. In the second fermentation, that's when you've like poured your kombucha into a an airtight bottle, and the scoby inside your kombucha, as it's eating the sugars and stuff, it releases carbon dioxide and it ferments itself, which is really cool. So it tastes like really good natural soda, and it's really cheap to make at home. Hmm. And do you put like fruit flavors in it or anything? Or yeah, you can. Oh, okay. I've seen some that are like blueberry, peach. One of my favorite flavors is actually ginger cayenne. That sounds pretty nice. It's a hot ginger ale kind of flavor. It's really cool. Just to seek clarification, is there any alcoholic content to this? Yes, but it's negligible. It's like zero point something percent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. It's very funny, though. You kept saying the word scoby. And that has a very different meaning in Ireland. <laughs> Every oh, time you no. said SCOBY, I was like smirking because <laughs> SCOBY is like the name for like, 
you know, a guy who'd go around and cause trouble and, you know, who'd uh, maybe mug you or, like, throw an egg at you on the street. Like, someone who's just kind of a, a rogue, a ne'er-do-well. Ah, uh, I see. There's a, a less polite... <laughs> Don't yeah, exactly, for them which as well. we probably can't say. But <laughs> <laughs> The cool thing that attracts me to home-brewing kombucha, after you grow the scoby pellicle initially, it costs six bags of tea and about a cup of sugar and some water, and that's all. Mm. And then whatever like flavoring ingredients you want in the second fermentation, but it's really cheap. All it takes is some time. That's pretty interesting. Today I had a bit of a an adventure in making a new drink as well, like because me and my girlfriend love Vietnamese coffee. Don't know if anyone's ever had that. It's like a really kind of strong, sort of sweet kind of coffee, um, really kind of like sharp taste and stuff. And but you put it in, uh, you put it in like an iced coffee, like a glass basically with ice and water and condensed milk, and then you stir it all up, and it's oh, it's absolutely delicious. And I found out how to make it for real today, like how to like uh, what, how much water you should put in and how much coffee you should put in. And you make it on this little strainer thing that you put on top of, a, on top of the glass. It's actually really cool. That sounds similar to Thai coffee, which I've had and really like. Probably very similar, yeah. It's like this little tiny saucepan and little uh, dish thing with holes in it that sits on top of your cup and you have to put just the right amount of water in so that it doesn't get too weak. But yeah, it's super, super delicious, like especially with condensed milk. Okay, so that's been it for another episode. Uh, See you in a couple of weeks. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Uh, I completely forget how we wrap things up. Do we do the say goodbye, guys, or I've been Connor, I've been whatever. No, we don't do the I've been thing. That's uh... (laughs) yeah, because because Joe will get angry across the pond.